April, can you hear can me? Everyone can hear April. As long as at your end, it's in sync now. I think it's better. All right. But I'm through my okay. computer audio. So if it starts breaking up, let me. when we come to it, just sharing your screen. I'm afraid to touch anything at this point. Okay. Um, and we can call to order the school board finance, June 1st finance committee meeting. Uh, so on our agenda today um, is just to review the, um, so at, at our last meeting, school board meeting, we made uh, some a recommendation to the leadership council just to go back and look at a few different areas um, and sort of to come back with, some adjustments of what that would look like based on our recommendations. And so the purpose of this meeting is to review that material and just give us the opportunity to ask questions. Um, for anyone who is dialed in at, from home um, or watching, first of all, I just wanna apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you for being patient with us. Um, we will do public comment at the end of our meeting. So it's scheduled to go from three to 4.30. I'm not sure if we'll need the whole time, but we will do public comment at the very end. Uh, for if you want to follow along, um, if you go to our website under the Finance Committee agenda, you'll find the materials that we'll review on the call today. Um, and if you are not interested in speaking but would like to make a public comment, um, or if you have to leave the meeting, you can send your comment to public comment at scarboroughschools.org, and we'll go ahead and read that in for the record. Um, so, Kate, if you want to go ahead and bring that up, I think we can um, sort of a, a start to talk through that. And I guess right. while so Kate is doing it, um, it looks oops, like I don't have the option to show. Take it back. I got it. Never mind. Found it. Sorry. Okay. Cool. Carry on. No worries. Um, so, what we had thought in, in terms of an approach for the meeting today, um, I know you guys have put you on the call, but also the rest of the leadership council have put a lot of time into getting this to, to us and getting it to us in advance of the meeting. So really appreciate that. Um, we actually have all had the opportunity to go through it um, in quite a bit of detail because you sent it on Friday. So we utilized the weekend and this morning to dig into that. So I don't want you to think your efforts went um, unutilized. So we did appreciate that. Um, and because we had the time to go through that, I think I don't know that we need to use this meeting to cover to cover every detail. I think um, maybe just a, a refresh and I can kind of read back to you how we're interpreting it. And then we can just open it up to questions. Um, I know I have some questions as do Alicia in April, I'm sure. So if everyone's okay with that approach, we'll start there. Cool. And I, actually I should, I should probably just say that um, I know this has been a really long process and I don't think a process is getting any shorter or any less difficult. Um, I don't know that we're in a position in the meeting today to necessarily make any recommendations or suggestions um, that, that will, I guess, give finite recommendations that we'll give to the board on a Thursday night. And the reason for that is because there's still a couple of things in motion um, that we're looking for some more information on from town council that are, I believe, on their agenda for Wednesday night to be covered off. So a couple of those items are um, whether or not we could utilize impact fees to fund um, some of the uh, planning and development work for a new school. Um, whether or not we could set up sort of a, a separate COVID-19 response fund. So right now, the way you guys are, or I guess prior to this proposal, you had that sort of scheduled in the added into the budget before we took the reductions. Uh, so one of the things we had talked about was, can we actually take that out of the reduction proposal and almost use that as a separate item? So say, you know, we've, we've met your goal, but also we have to recognize the times we're in and, and there's going to be additional cost because of that and sort of take it as a separate bucket. Um, and then the third item was around capital improvement um, and sort of getting a little bit more clear direction from them as to whether or not we can actually pull more from capital rather than our operating budget. So I know that 
in this recommendation, you guys have put forward some additional capital items. So um, assuming that we do give, get the formal go ahead to do that, then we can pull a little bit more from capital instead of our operating budget. Um, previously, we were under the impression that we had to hold to the limits which they agreed to at their first reading. So we have, um, we'll, we'll take information that we get from this meeting, um, information that we get from the town council meeting on Wednesday night, and then we'll have another finance committee meeting on Thursday before our board meeting where we'll come together and figure out um, what we want to do, what kind of recommendations we want to make as a finance committee to the overall board on Thursday. Any questions on that? Okay. Cool. Um, so, Kate, how um, I am interpreting this, and April and Alicia, if you guys are interpreting this differently, you can kind of shout, but I don't know, Kate, if you want to scroll down just a little bit. Yeah, keep going. Awesome. So, um, at our board meeting, the recommendations that we made, basically how we're interpreting this is you guys put all those things back in and that came to an amount of 633,000. Um, and then based on the conversation we had, we said, go ahead and pull out the COVID-19 additions, which, which were yeah, about 433,000, which brings us to a total, um, oh, sorry, that you've updated the items in motion and so right. with the combination of take, taking out the COVID-19 and updating the items in motion, there's still about $150,000-ish that we need to find in order to hit the current town council goal. Sarah, I guess I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So before we um, go past the, the COVID question, which I know needs some work from the town council side, um, as far as what they, how they think that looks. Is it your understanding that we would still have the $430,000 in our operating budget, but we would consider it separately from them? Or are we talking about like a completely different fund? Uh, based on a conversation that I think Leanne had this morning with Paul, I don't know that it's necessarily a different fund. I think the way that I'm thinking about it is if you remember last year with our budget conversations, we had said, yep, yeah, we'll work towards this goal, whatever that goal was. Um, however, if there are circumstances that come up, such as enrollment, that we need to add certain things back in, then we just need to be a little bit flexible. So we'll meet the goal and then we'll add to it if we need to. And I think we're approaching this in a similar way. So we'll meet the goal just based on our operating budget current and then we'll we'll say but given COVID-19 and the uncertainty of what school will look like when we go back to the fall there's some additional costs that are going to be associated with that and so here's an additional 430,000 that we need to put into our operating budget so that it's there to support but we don't want that to be considered necessarily as part of not meeting the, meeting the goal. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was wondering about. Like, where does it fit into the picture of the budget as we need to approve it? Um, so it's it's it would still be operating budget. It would still be, you know, appropriated funds, but it wouldn't be like a, a oh, you failed to meet the target. Yeah, and I should be clear that this is not something necessarily that we've agreed with town council. We've right. discussed it with them and, and kind of given them the heads up that this is how we're, we're thinking of approaching it because the cost is so significant, right? It's not like it's just $25,000. Right. Pretty significant. So, um, yeah, we'll present it that way and we'll, we'll see how they take it. Okay. The, the question that I have, I, I, if I can articulate it, is that when we, so I was in support of sort of separating that money out because I, th I think it helps to show where we are in reality and that we need new investments in order to even get to baseline. But um, where are we, like, what's the target date for presenting that portion of the budget to town council, to them? And then 
getting their feedback in terms of how we're going to meet the funds of the COVID, the 430 from the COVID. So if we have to come up with 430 for COVID pending sort of federal reimbursement or state reimbursement, for example, or, or further guidance from the town council, when does that refinement occur in the process? If you have to put the, um, 430,000 into your operating budget and get approval for it that way, um, then you would want to do that at your second reading so that it was part of what the town council was talking about at their second reading. Because that would have to, if it's in your K-12 operating budget, then it has to go to the voters. So you want to, you would want to have that be part of what you guys approve for your regular general fund budget. Um, to your point then, Kate, if that were the case, then would we have to find another $430,000 in cuts? I think what Sarah's saying is, here's our budget, here's the $2 million re reduction that we made in our budget, and oh gosh, we have to add 430000 back. So we've met the target with the what we knew, and now we're adding back 430000 to cover the cost of COVID stuff. So I guess that's the part that I'm confused about. Where's the part that we go, oh, here's our budget, we met your budget, and now we've got to add, when, when does that part occur? We'd have to articulate it all as part of the second reading, in my opinion. It would be the, the board saying, here are the reductions that we're making in response to what the town council has asked us at their first reading. And here's our bottom line, but our bottom line is $430,000 higher than that number. Would it be worthwhile yeah. to request a joint finance committee meeting, Sarah? Or, or are we past that point? So the other, um, so yes, I, I do think potentially that could be valuable. I think um, what I've heard is that one of the scenarios on the table is that um, town council delays the second reading, which could mean that we could delay our second reading until we have more information from them. So that would, I think, give time for a joint finance committee meeting before our second reading. Um, or regardless of what they do, we can choose to delay ours in order to try and get a joint finance committee in before that we have our second reading vote. There. Ultimately, if, if if they go first, right, so if they have their second reading before us, then we definitely need to have either, well, we need to have a joint finance committee meeting so that we can express to them where we are with the budget process. Otherwise, our way of communicating that to them is through our second reading. And what does that look like if it's in our second reading and... and it's inconsistent with what they're doing. I think I have never, I don't know. I think we could craft it in a way um, similar to how town council kind of crafts some of their language and just be really clear and say very explicitly like this is the this is what the school board is approving at our second reading. We are approving a the budget that was given to us by the town council at the first reading to meet the 2% goal, which now it's like we've seen so many different versions of the budget, but it's roughly that $2 million reduction. So we would approve a budget that was in line with that $2 million reduction and then have language in our motion that said we are seeking additional approval of 400 and whatever thousand dollars for the purposes of COVID related expenses in excess of, and then whatever our net budget that we're asking, whatever our net budget is that we're approving, we would just ask for that like very clearly in excess of that number. And, and what happens if they reject that? 
then I think we're back to Diane's question, which is then we need to find an additional $400,000 in our budget to make room for the COVID stuff. Yeah, and um, what's happened in the past is that the, the board has met after the town council's second reading and vote. And that's when we get the bottom line number of what's being allocated to the schools for their budget. And sometimes that number matches with what we've done at second reading and sometimes it doesn't. So if it were the case that the that we gave a larger number to the council and they said, no, you can't have that, then we would have to meet again and figure out where that extra money was going to be coming from before it goes to the um, to the voters. And then what happens? There's a third reading. Um, no, you're making a you're making another vote to amend the budget based on what the okay. council gives you. Okay. So Thank you've you. done your first and second reading. You've passed the school board's budget, but then the town council says you actually have X dollars, not Y dollars, and so you go back and you vote on where those dollars come from. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, what then I then I continue to support the that I, that concept. Um, I just. <sighs> I just um, worry about how information gets um, uh, spread out in our community and, and that people won't necessarily understand what's happening. So I think it's important that we are pretty clear in our, in our messaging what we're doing and why, um, because there could be potentially, you know, we're in the clear and then 400, over $400,000 worth of cuts that, that need to happen again. Uh, that worries me. Is there a way to get even a thumbs up behind the scenes if this is even realistic with the council before we make any assumptions? Because I'm worried if, if if it's mostly thumbs down, we might as well know that up front. Yeah, so this is kind of the purpose of us reconvening on Thursday is we've asked them to have a discussion on it at their meeting tomorrow night. Okay, so I'll wait and for that. Thank you. And yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that we'll get any direction, but we've asked multiple times over email and asked them to put it on their agenda for tomorrow night, so. Another way that you could but, present a piece of, um, of information that, that takes into account the, the concept that Sarah's talking about would be to have two versions ready for second reading and to say, you know, okay, so if we need to cut deeper and we need to find $430,000, here's what it looks like. And if we don't, then here's what it looks like. Um, so that you're, you're poised to communicate clearly in either direction. There's just the, the amount of iterations that we're trying to do this year is insane, right? I mean, if yeah. we hit this target goal, if we hit that target goal, and then, well, what do you want us to do with all the COVID money and, and that iteration? I mean, I think it's fair if we laid it out just like we had the tier, you know, that initial spreadsheet with all the tiers on it. I think it if we as a school board finance committee prioritize those tiers, I think it's fair to present that and say, this is where we're at with the budget that we approve. And if we need to take $450,000, then this is what it's gonna look like. And town council will be able to make an educated decision on whether or not they want to increase our budget by $450,000 to allow for the COVID or whether they look at the cuts we're going to have to make and because that's because I think that's a that's a fair question for them to want to know they're going to want to know the impact of approving that additional money but we've already I mean there's so you're so right Alicia because there are so many versions of the budget now but I do think we need to have it very late clearly laid out what the tiers are still so that people know what they're voting on in terms of whether it's a budget that they can support well, but now are we doing a, a tier, uh, the, the tier that brings us to the 2% and then with, with, uh, with and without a COVID contingency? 
Yeah, I guess so. But I, I agree, and, and I, I agree with that approach, though, April, and I think um, maybe that's what we spend our time Thursday is kind of putting together as a working session what those proposals would look like. Because at that point, I think we'll we'll hopefully have you know the information we need from Sandy and Kate and Diane and the rest of the leadership council, and it's really just direction from town council that we need at this point. I was just did a scroll of the attendee list to see if um, any of them were on, but it doesn't look like it. So. I know this is going too far out on on a limb but if the council postpones their second reading does that impact the referendum date no idea i can't imagine that they i don't i know one of the things that we always question and it came up at communications committee the other day was um this idea that people can take their can request an absentee ballot um that is not that does not reflect the actual approved budget on it and i read the newsletter that the town council sent out today that we all if you subscribe you got the town council newsletter and it was the wording of it was a little different and it made it sound like you can request an absentee ballot but that toady won't mail them until the referendum number is set so she's kind of, it, but that maybe that's just my interpretation of, of how it's read, but I can't imagine that they are going to move. The yeah. Election. What, is, what yeah. is the timeline? Yeah. Well, it's a wonder and it's something that I'm sure we'll hear more about when the town council meets. I think that the, the ballots are interesting in that in the past, they don't have a number on them. They just right. say, do you approve the budget that was passed by the town council on X date? And so, you know, you could have a ballot in your hand that right. would be valid um, for a vote after you knew what the number was. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, uh, that's kind of a diversion, but it's a wonder for me. If, if we, we continue to postpone the votes, then what happens at the, to the, the end game of all this? Yep, no, it's a fair question. And hopefully that'll, they'll discuss that as part of their decision. Sarah, I think we lost you there again. I don't hear her. I see your hand moving. Okay. Then is it we asked? to look into and some options and Sarah you're you're going in and out is it me or did I miss more detail uh, start firing off questions if, if we have I cannot hear Sarah either I can either Sarah we've lost your audio okay. again uh, okay it looks So I'm wondering if Sarah should try to log back in to see if that's more successful or can you um, do the audio piece on your phone and the video piece on your computer? I don't know if she can hear you. I, I can hear you guys now. Oh, good. Hey, there you are. We can hear you. Okay. We missed a big piece of, of important stuff because your hand was moving, but there were no words. I was moving. <laughs> <laughs> your hands in your mouth, no, but no I was, words were uh, coming. Sorry, this is so annoying. I, I was just saying um, the remainder of the document is you know, you guys sort of responding to our request for more information or looking at areas that we had suggested 
um, for additional cost savings or reductions, rather. Um, and so I, I just was asking April and Alicia if, if they felt that they needed any further discussion or for you guys to elaborate on any of those areas or if you just were comfortable opening it up to questions. I was going to throw out uh, two things. One is that um, I didn't, we didn't include any um, bonded items on the list for consideration, but there has been a lot of conversation about the high school STEM lab. And so there's a, there's a story about what that is, what that project is and why it was requested. And then that leads to the facility storage space for the stuff that's in where the lab belongs. So that was one piece I wanted to make sure that you had noticed. And then the other thing was that, um, you know, we, we can go back through the full capital budget and find other things and talk about those. And Todd's ready to, to speak to whatever's on there in his area. Um, and then the other piece was that just before we met, we got this really cool new um, spreadsheet from Sean Bushway from Power School. And I linked that in at the bottom here. This is page eight um, of uh, enrollment and class size data by phase. And he, he charted it out with the individual classrooms. And I thought that was um, some super useful information. So that's in there now too. Before we dive into this document, I just want to make sure it's it's hard. Real, it's so detailed that I think this is a hard document on the screen that people know that they can access it on home if they go to the standing committee's finance link and then supporting documents. It's posted there so you can follow along at home. Very good point. Yeah, it's um, there's a, a PDF on there. Uh, that's posted, but it, and it also includes all these links. So this is um, what we're looking at as a live Google Doc that you can click on the link and open it up. But if you're reading from home, all of those links are just at the end of the document, so you can still see them. So, so to answer your question, Sarah, I'm I'm happy to just dig right in because I've reviewed the docket do document thoroughly over the weekend. Yeah, me too. Awesome, go for it. Actually, if somebody else wants to start, I'm trying to pull it up on my own screen so I can scroll around in it if you're if you're handier than I am. <laughs> it's kind of tough. Yeah, um, I guess one question I had, Kate, and this relates to your um, point about the facility garage for Todd, that 392000 in the budget that's scheduled to be bonded for the STEM lab, does that include the facility space or is the facility space an additional line item? Facility space is a separate line item. It's under facility support equipment and I believe it's 250 total. Can you repeat that, Kate? Was and that that for the just the building two fifty? Yeah. Let let me. Um, I actually think it's two ninety nine is the line item. Right. I'm getting the detail for the line item here, so you can see. Thank you. Can you see the new and improved little page here? Is this mm -hmm. the link? Is this the CIP link in the document? Yeah, this is the CIP detail, the first one. Oh, okay. And it has, um, you know, as you can see, it has a description of everything to do with the, the first reading budget. Um, right here at the top of this page. What page is that? Do you know? Well, I can't get you guys out of my way to see. Page five. Number. Thank you. Sorry. Page <laughs> five. Yep. I shouldn't be allowed to drive. Uh, so the STEM, create STEM lab space is 300,000 on this chart. It actually ended up being 392 because we got a firm quote. Um, and so that's where the 92,000 was added at our first reading. Um, and then under facility support equipment on the next page, you've got some replacement floor scrubbers. Um, you've got the 
truck and then you've got 250,000 for the garage. Um, the 299 is the auto scrubbers and the uh, storage garage. And then 55 was called out separately under a vehicle line. It's kind of confusing going from this to the what's in the budget book because those are just single line items, but this has a lot more detail about what we're, we're putting in those lines. So then when I go and cross-reference it with the document that shows us what's appropriated or bonded, that garage is under a bonded? Yes. Okay. And, and the STEM lab as well. Okay. Yeah, let's see if we can get there from here. Um, so that second document that's linked in here is the little grid that shows A's and B's. Appropriated is A and B yeah. is bonded. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Kate, um, I guess related to the uh, CIP budget, we had talked about that long range planning line, which is scheduled to be appropriated, um, which currently has $100,000 in it. Um, you know, if we were to continue, if the board was going to continue to move forward with the, the project for the school, we would actually need to add money into that in order to have sufficient funds to fund this project. Um, to the tune of about 275000 more dollars. The question I think for you is, um, even if, you know, the town council or some folks on town council have suggested that we may, they may look to combine some of the big school, uh, some of the big town projects, so the school, community center, and library into one and sort of pick them all back up as one and move forward. Um, but kind of regardless of whether that happens or whether we decide to move forward on our own, the the need for the school doesn't go away that just because we're in a pandemic. So, but if we're not going to use that project next year, we need to make a decision as to whether we keep that hundred thousand dollars in there. So, I guess the question is, if we keep it in there can we add to that year over year to sort of make up a balance for when we do do the project and sort of utilize the funds, whether it's next year or the year after that, um, so that we have them in there as reserves for when we do decide to move forward? That's a hard question for me to answer because it, it goes to the funding source. Um, if we, we can get budgetary authority for something in CIP, and not spend it in that year. It is a multi-year program. So for example, a good thing comes to mind uh, of roofing repairs that we had a, a large repair at the high school. We had the money budgeted for um, last year for the summer and we did not spend it because we did a big long arduous bid process. And um, it's only just now that we're getting around to getting that work done. So the money, the budgetary authority doesn't go away. Um, I don't know, however, whether the town would actually appropriate those funds since it's tax dollars, whether they would take those funds in the tax year in which the budget is approved, or if they would then have to raise taxes for it in an ensuing year, if it was going to be appropriated. That part, I don't know, uh, it's not, something that I have control over. Does that make any sense? I don't know if they would have to take the $100,000 this year and put it in the bank and wait for us for, to, put, to add to it. Um, gotcha. Is now that there, something we can find out? Because I think that's gonna, I mean, help us as we make our recommendation to the board. I can certainly ask Ruth how that would work. Yeah, I'm I'm struggling with this too. I don't see a path for us putting three hundred and fifty thousand dollars away for the architect all in one budget year. And so I am very curious 
if there's a path for us to do it in increments like this and kind of create a savings account for lack of a better word for that investment or for that money that we know we're going to need to spend um but if that isn't an option um and we are faced with needing to put the 350 thousand into one single budget cycle, then that to me says that that $100,000 that's being um, budgeted for right now could be put towards something else. Right. All right. I'll, I'll reach out to Ruth and ask her that question. Um, I know it's simple if it were bonded, because if it were bonded, you just wouldn't borrow the money until you were ready to use it. And we do that all the time where we have multi-year projects going on. Um, what I'm, what I don't know is if it's scheduled to be appropriated, do they appropriate it in that current year and then save the money? Um, the other way of looking at it too would be, um, and we talked about this at another meeting, would be to think about the scope of work and is there some work that can be done with that hundred thousand dollars that moves us forward and that doesn't then expire or, you know, become less useful over time, um, and I, I don't really know the answer to that. That's something that the building committee was thinking about. Um, but I'll, I'll find that out, uh, find out about the funding piece. Oh, Alicia, I think I, I can oh. hear you, I've lost you. Oh, sorry, I now have two mute buttons going on. Um, <laughs> Uh, did we ever ask the question if we if we can um, use the impact fees to fund the architect study? Yeah, so that was the other question that we asked, um, and they're bringing it up for discussion tomorrow night at town council. Okay. The feedback that I re I received was, I mean, they don't have a definitive vote on it yet, but I don't think we should get our hopes up. That was the that was the, the one that they were. That I received. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was the one that they were sort of lukewarm on. Okay. Yeah. Um, April, Alicia, what other questions do you guys have? Um, so the, let me pull up my document. The most feedback that I've gotten from the latest round is about the assistant athletic director. Same. So that's on page, what, six? Yeah. Um, it, it, is that, so that position is called an admin assistant position but it's just referred to as the assistant athletic director. Is that right? Are they one and the same? Yes. He's the administrative assistant for that department. Okay. Um, but when people refer to the ath assistant athletic director, they refer to him. It's, it's, it's one and the same person. Well, there isn't another person. So. I'm just, I'm just asking because I've, I just want to make sure that I understand who's who. Um, yeah. I, I I don't mean to be snarky. I'm just I haven't heard that. Okay. Used. Oh, I that's the way he's referred to in the community to me at least. Um, so is that that's an an admin position? It's an admin support position, I guess you'd say. It's uh, he's in the same category as the central office administrative support team, so like payroll specialist or. Um, special education admin assistant. And who supervises the the um, the overtime and approves it? Mike. Okay. okay What's along those same lines? Do you know? Oh, sorry, Alicia. No, go for it. Just to, do you or do either of you guys know and if not maybe you can get back to us like what the average overtime is for administrative assistance? I don't know. 
I mean, it, there's such a diverse group. Some have no overtime, some have overtime. Um, I, I don't know that there's a sort of standard. They all and is that under on. like a, are they all under like a, a bargaining unit? No, they're among the handful of us that don't belong to a bargaining unit. Central Office Administrative Staff and Central Office Administrators don't have bargaining unit. So their overtime is their overtime pay is the same, or it's, it could differ depending on the person. Um, they have a salary table, and it, yeah, their wages differ based on the person. So their overtime differs based on the person. So that's not a salaried position. There's no overtime in salary positions. Right. That's why that's why they give them to us. That's why who gives them to you? People who want us to work longer. I'm being I'm I'm being sarcastic, Alicia. Oh, I know. I mean, I'm a salary employee and I work a, a lot of hours, so I I just am trying to understand how many how many of um the, it, those individuals do we have on the payroll that fall into that that are because I, what I want to flush out is who's getting overtime and it's just showing up under payroll as part of their salary and so it's unclear what their salary is versus what what overtime is. So I wouldn't be able to tell you that. Uh, off the cuff, I could tell you what people earned, like I could give you last year um, in that group. And again, it's a very diverse group. So um, it would really vary dependent on the, um, on the position. My guess is that we'll find that the overtime that's budgeted for the athletics department is going to be the most significant because of the fact that they work nights and weekends and most of our other specialists don't work nights and weekends unless they're asked to do a specific task. So can I ask to get the, um, and then maybe I have to do this through you, Sarah, the, the either the total breakdown for overtime in the district, like what those positions are so that we know, or in the athletic department, I don't know what others feel about that. I would, I would like to know at the very least what the impact overtime has. Um, and if like, I, you know, forgive me for this hasn't come up before, but I, I didn't realize that we had employees that were getting overtime. And is that something that could be furloughed? I mean, can we, can we say absolutely or curtailed, whichever the correct word is, um, you know, is that something that we could absolutely say no to for the FY21 school year? Or is that, you know, something that is like Sarah said, I mean, uh, Kate said, is a product of the hours that there are, you know, on nights and weekends. But if there are, if they have a number of hours that they're expected to work during the week, that seems to me that it could be adjusted to account for the nights and weekends um in order to put a stop on paying overtime that being said i i'll be honest i'm uncomfortable because this is a specific um person's position that we're discussing but furthermore just i'm having a hard time with almost eighty thousand um, dollars for a position that um could be a classroom teacher and we're making some really hard decisions this year. And this to me is, is a very large um, expense in salary. So I'm hearing a couple of things. One is, um, can we, are we allowed to not have overtime? And of course we can say, you know what, we're not gonna have overtime and if the work doesn't get done, then it doesn't get done. Um, you, you need to stay within your scheduled hours. There's a, a couple of issues around collective bargaining with the, um, the uh, food service staff have a special rate that they get paid for doing catering after school hours. Custodians have a seniority list and call time and bus drivers as well if they're driving trips. 
um, are entitled to a seniority list and, and overtime. Um, we can take a look at what that amounts to. Um, and I, I think it would be probably a question that we would want to um, look into the individual contracts and um, see what the impacts might be. But in terms of central office staff, which we just said doesn't have a collective bargaining agreement, we can say today there's not going to be any overtime available for any of that, those staff members. And if there's work that needs to be done, then someone else needs to be doing that. That isn't going to get overtime for it. Can I ask this question? What um, is it? How is it organized so that we have these hourly employees versus versus salaried employees? Well, wage and labor laws uh, specify certain restrictions on who can be salaried, um, who's an exempt employee, um, and, and that's that's state and federal labor law says that unless you have these certain characteristics of an executive position, you have to be paid hourly. So, so it's, things okay, like so. Super, supervising other individuals, um, there's a, a salary level piece to it, uh, but it's there are some rules and regs around who can be salaried. Um, so, a uh, classic example is the, the superintendent's executive secretary gets to be salaried because she has to come to all the board meetings and she's getting overtime. Well, you, you really can't do that because that's not an exempt position. It's not an administratively exempt position under the law. So, so that position actually sounds to me as though it might fall into a salaried position. That's why I was asking that question. Um, there's no direct supervision by uh, this individual of, of, of other staff. Okay. Now you could decide that you want a salaried position that is an administrative position in that department or in any other department. And you could add that person and say, this is a salaried position and you supervise these people. And these are the, the ways that you get to be a salaried person. Um, but it, it kind of sounds to me like we're trying to go in the opposite direction from that. That we're trying to, to make it more of a, a classic administrative assistant position that doesn't have overtime. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just trying to avoid, I mean, in my mind, if, if that had been a salaried position, we probably wouldn't be in this quandary now. So I'm, I'm just trying to think about that as I'm trying to understand the positions moving forward, what what makes sense moving forward, because that could have been capped off, I think, if we had that. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things to bear in mind about this very small group of people, there's only about a dozen people doing these jobs, and they're in this um, non-bargaining unit separate situation by the nature of their jobs, because they do odd things uh, that are one-offs in the district. Um, there's, you know, there's only one person doing accounts payable and receivables. And she has a very different set of duties from the person who sits next to her who manages the special education office. So can we get that list? Um, Sarah, I don't know if that, the request has to come through you for the overtime positions in, in the district, just so we understand what, what that is, what their responsibilities are when we're trying to make some of those decisions. There's, there's two questions in your question. One is who are the central office administrative support staff? And then there's a question about overtime because not all of those people would work overtime. Well, I don't even know Kate if they're in central office. That's why I'm asking the question. I don't know who they are. So you so, want to know who works overtime. That's a different question. And how much it is. Yeah. Okay. And is that across all groups in the school district that you're looking for that for? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, that's easy enough to pull. I can get that. Okay, thank you. Guys, before we move on, I did just want to take a second. We're getting um, quite a few comments that come in through the Q&A. I just want to remind everyone that per our board practice, um, we do take public comment at the end of the meeting. Uh, and in order to make a public comment, we will ask that you just state your name and your address just for the record. If you have to leave and you can't stay, you can always email public comment at scarboroughschools.org. And again, we'll read that into the record. 
sorry. Thank you. Go ahead, Alicia, if you had more questions. Is the admin assistant still in the budget? I thought that was the, the position that we had um, talked about removing. Um, so far, we've removed $4,000, which is a portion of that job. Um, and Mike has told us that he is ready to take the rest of that job away, but there hasn't been any action taken on that offer. Is that the, so is, was that the one that was at point eight? Um, she was at point four. The request, the, the initial request, Alicia, was for her to go from point four to point eight, I believe. Right. And then right. when we made our first round of reductions, she actually was going from point four to point two. Okay, so this would mm -hmm. reflect point two. Um, the total that's left in the budget, let's put it this way, the total that's left in the budget for that position is 15, sorry, is 11,759. So we could, we could use that as a further reduction to the budget that's on the table right now. Well, do you want to um, go ahead and ask some questions? Oh, you cut out, Alicia. What did you say? Sorry. Do you want to ask some questions? <sighs> sure. So, Kate, one of the things first, you know, I I am struggling because I don't have paper. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I can't hear you, April. Can anybody else? I can hear her. Yes, yeah, I can hear her. Morning, Sarah. You want me to wait? Who couldn't hear you? Sarah. Sarah, can you hear her now? Doesn't look like it. I don't think she can hear me either. Sarah? Yeah, it seems like maybe if she logged off and just did a, a phone in, even though video is preferable, that might I'll text her. be more reliable. I'm wondering if it's her headphones. She generally uses them. Right, true. All right, Sarah says she's going to try and reconnect, but to just go on without her for a minute. Um, so my, I have a little bit of apprehension about that because she's the chair. <laughs> I feel like my next request probably needs to go through her. Um, but I, in the interest of moving all of us forward as a group, um, I'm feeling 
a little bit of information overload and not, and, and I like, I like this, like I, this is my preferred method of being able to look at this so that I can say, okay, if we make X, Y, and Z reductions, this is the impact on the net budget. This is the impact on our overall tax request. And this is what the, you know, proposal that goes to town council, and this is how it's going to impact the mill rate. And I feel like because we've dug so deep and we've had to make so many requests of you guys that a little bit of the prioritization, you know, I, I'm not sure that we're all on the same page. I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not sure that the committee itself is on the same page. And I, I'm having a hard time looking at the information that you gave us on the document for the weekend and inserting it into the tiers, for example. Does that, do you guys know what I'm saying? Do you know what I mean? Yes, because that was my question sort of about the point four position where, you know, how does, where does that come into the tiers? Right. And so it's our job as the finance committee to set the priorities and let the um, leadership council know, let Sandy by extension, the leadership council know what our priorities are. And then to ask Kate to help us put that into a document that we can present to the rest of the board. Um, but I, I just feel like everything is a little bit scattered around. And so I'm wondering if as a finance committee, do we now need to look at the information that was given to us on Friday, which is this document that Kate is sharing and say, okay, yes, we would like to see these cost savings inserted into the the table that Kate created and just go through the list and say, no, I can't support that being included in the cuts or yes, I would like to see that included in the reductions because right now we have all, I feel like we have all the information we could possibly need. Now we just have to make our choices and it's our job as a committee to put that forward to the board in a way that they, I mean, I, I'm confident that they believe that we've asked all the questions and that we are making informed choices. Um, but I still don't know what this all looks like now in order for it to all come together and say, okay, this is what the school board's finance committee's tier four recommendations look like. And here they all are in a big long list. That would be great. I think because we tend to flounder it just a little bit, that's very natural. But due to time, I, I just wonder if we could at least get to that point tonight if possible. Okay, well, I'm glad my instincts for what we need <laughs> What we need to do are in line with yours, Sandy, um, Sarah, and Alicia. What do you think? Like, how, what? How is the best way to move forward now and say, as a committee, these are the reductions we would support seeing move to the top of these of the tiers? I think that. Oh, sorry, Sarah. Go ahead.
seven minutes, right? And we need to discuss as a finance committee what, now that we've asked our questions, well, seven minutes before questions open up, right, in theory. Um, and, and so we need to have the discussion about collectively what, what our thoughts are. Can we confirm that before you move on? So those are the two positions that are already in the tier four reduction. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. Okay. So yes. Um, so additional instructional coach position reductions Oh, you, you're speaking about, can you see this on the screen still? Um, so you would take two more instructional coaches as long as they didn't bump an existing teacher. Um, Go ahead, Diane. I was just going to say the other piece that I would just caution you to consider is um, what that support looks like according to phase. I appreciate the conversation about not wanting to lay anyone off, but if you know if those open positions are clustered at one specific phase, for example, we don't want one phase to have inequitable support and another phase to enjoy the same support that they've had. Do you understand kind of where I'm going with that? Does that make sense? Well, how many, how many instructional coaches would that leave? If you take two from middle school and two from Wentworth, middle school has basically none, point one, and Wentworth has one. That's what the grid up here is the existing people. Um, so we've already taken one of Wentworth and one of middle school here in tier four, and then that would be another Wentworth and another middle school. That makes sense? So that's shifting four out of 11? Where are you getting a look? Wasn't the what wasn't eleven the number for the um, instructional coaches? For the whole for the whole district. Right. Well, I think Diane's point was that if you make those moves, then you may have some inequities, and so I, I was just trying to figure out we, we'd have. Right, like the way I'm looking at it, from what Kate is saying right now, Wentworth would be losing two coaches, and so yeah. that would be significant for one one specific school. I mean, I think anything is possible. It just depends on what the directive is or, or the way that you want to see this happen. because presumably these folks hold similar certifications, um, at least within K to eight. But, but, but the 
question, I guess the pres to to circle back, Sarah, you you were making sort of your statement of what you where you were currently, and you indicated that you could support the instructional coach coach reduction as or sh shifting if it was a shifting is the way I understood it and that and my question was is that in fact a shift meaning that we're not going to lose any jobs and so I think they, what I understand is the answer is yes and we're still retaining over half of the um, instructional coaches. I think if you look down at the third bullet, it kind of um, explains the thought process behind this number. So the new position would be at $81,000, which is that target number that we utilize for teacher positions um, when we think about hiring new teachers because we have to take into account benefits. Um, that people might choose, whether they choose individual benefits, family benefits, et cetera. Um, okay, you had it and now you've moved it. Come back to me. Um, and then because we're trying to encapsulate the critical pieces of, of these three different roles into one, we would have to carve out some of this um, into teacher stipended work, um, such as um, the, the piece under the library media specialist um, to do. And again, you can see the bulleted list of the things that, that need to happen. I'm happy to bring Monique in to also speak more to this if you would like that. Wait, I don't understand. So you can't just pay them $81,000 for this new position? You can pay them $81,000 for a position, but as you all started the conversation with, there's a whole lot to for one person to now do three people's work. Yeah. Correct. So for example, um, you know, one of those people right now holds a library media specialist certificate. We probably would be hard pressed to find a three for one person who is that credential holder. I could add some more thinking to that. Um, what we were trying to do is to um, leverage um, as many of these pieces as possible. Um, as Diane said, it is going to be quite challenging to find one position. Um, but in terms of the library media piece, um, we talked about several different ideas, whether that be additional funding, whether that be adding um, days to the Library media specialists fall under the teacher contract, adding days in order to accomplish those tasks to their contracts. Um, <clears throat> we just don't know what that might look like at this point. 
um, depending on who and where they are in the salary range, how much that would cost. Um, and in terms of that new position, um, that is the estimate that we use with all new positions. Uh, and so that is to make sure that we have enough funding um, uh, available. Um, so that includes salary and benefits. Um, and so we would be asking someone to do those pieces or have those responsibilities, but get paid less. And most likely it would be a um, central office staff position rather than a salaried position, um, which um, that was our thinking anyway. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Right, and for the position, do bear in mind that it's not an $81,000 salary. That's a combination of salary and benefits. So we would be trying to um, do more with less in that position. And those pieces, if they're unable to be done, they, um, they sit. Things just take longer to accomplish. a little bit of better understanding of um, a path forward and if we're going to use this Thursday So it would be helpful for me, Sarah, to know if you would like us to come, to wait to hear the directive or the, the feedback from town council tomorrow, and then for April and I to come prepared um, for the meeting on Thursday to have that discussion with you or come with our own thoughts or what, how do you, do you want to work it out as a group or? or Concern about that is that if it's the 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 two percent, I think that that's easy. And then if we if we start getting the COVID stuff, and that's different, then that's going to be a whole different conversation that I don't know that I can formulate in a day or two days. Well, actually, it'll be a day because we'd get the information tomorrow. So I, th I think my plan will be to get as much as I can for the for the for the two percent, if that's okay. Okay.
Uh, so <clears throat> the first person that's listed is Brianna Kelman. So she should be on. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Brianna Kelman, 220 Pine Point Road in Scarborough. I'm here today just speaking as a teacher. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak and for the work you're doing. I know it's not easy. Um, I'm the department chair of the World Languages at Scarborough High School and a Spanish teacher. I just wanted to speak to support the written communications from my department members over the last several weeks regarding the digital world language subscriptions for our students that are now being cut from the budget proposal. Um, it's important for me to say that we're not frivolously making a budget request to ask for a shiny new curriculum when we know resources are scarce. We're asking for this funding to provide continuity of essential digital resources for nearly one in four students at Scarborough High School. These resources empower students to learn to practice all modes of communication, listening, reading, writing, speaking in the Spanish language. And they also aid teachers in delivering a quality foreign language experience. So we've relied on a digital learning platform for almost a decade, and those licenses are now expiring. We simply do not have other resources for students to fall back on. So loss of access to this platform will be devastating for our Spanish program. It's especially important right now as distance learning and teaching can probably are going to be a part of our lives into the future. Having a digital platform available is how we were able to deliver curriculum for the last three months of this school year. Um, in my most recent communication sent this weekend, my colleagues and I shared with you some data that demonstrate and support why subscriptions for the online platform are necessary for students to continue achieving an art program at a high level. So we're asking for your help to maintain the current strength of our program, offer students tools to learn and teachers to do their jobs. And hopefully you'll consider all this information that we provided to you when you're making your final decisions. Um, so thank you for your time with that. And as an aside, I just wanted to mention that the document that you have, the um, FY21 budget review document that you reviewed today, lists the requested amount for Scarborough High School is 18750 However, the current request, um, there's just been a couple iterations of it, is currently at 9660 and provides materials for students in just Spanish 1 through 3. I just wanted to clarify that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just so jump right in real quick here. Um, what was in the budget right now is the 18750 and we have Bree's new um, amount of 90, whatever it is. I think it's a reduction of 90,000. I, <laughs> I wish it was of 9,000, uh, which has not has not been booked yet because again these are all decision points so what you're seeing with the eighteen thousand right there is what we have in the budget today and we can certainly make that adjustment as part of our dis discretionary fund reductions can we put that in the the items in motion chart mm -hmm. yep. that Yes, you do lose materials. The original budget request was for text, classroom sets of text, as well as the online subscriptions. What Bri did in working with her department, they said we will um, forego the student text this year and only do use the online. Brianna, correct me if I'm wrong on that. That was my understanding. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, the original request was for a six year subscription because that's what each language typically does. And that was for levels one through four. And so in between now and the last few iterations, it's come down to just Spanish one through three. Um, so those are the most critical levels to focus on with the transition and um, just for um, about 210 students. bring that person in. Thank 
Hello. Hello. Oh great, I have the full mine open, so I'll disconnect that. There's no echo. So um I'm thank you for the meeting today. It was very helpful. My concern is that I'm not in the town, I'm a resident. And I think that I would like to know if you can just talk about the pandemic for two minutes. So we have like 60 seconds of your time. Can you hear me okay? Per pursuant to our um, policy, could you please state your name and address? Oh, Anne uh, Pillsbury and Scarborough. And my concern is that um, I think that the school budget should be revised at IT security folks. Uh, two or three, a lot of people right now are hacking schools, banks, businesses in the U.S., um, people from this country as well as overseas. This morning, for example, the American Humane Society website was hacked and some Japanese thing was up there. So anyone clicking on that website could have had their computer compromised. Um, I know this because this is something that is in my, my line of work. So my suggestion for the school board would, in school budget, people in Scarborough schools as well as the town would be to potentially hire more people in IT security, secure your, your town website, train all of the families in Scarborough, do some like training sessions to say, please only use Zoom web-based. If you use the Zoom client, download to your computer, you will get hacked. There's a lot of security issues. Just use a Chromebook. Don't, don't use Zoom on your family computer. Have an empty computer as I'm using now with no personal information. Just use a web-based Zoom to secure your personal data on your own home computers. My other suggestion would be to bump, bump, bump up the online learning because I personally am not sending my child to school in the fall. Until, there's a, a pande until the pand pandemic is calmed down, there's a vaccination, there is no way I will send my child to school where he will be an innocent child and my daughter will be an innocent daughter and maybe lick something or touch something or share sports equipment or something will happen where they will get coronavirus and die, to be frank with you. So I would like to know if you can bump up all your online learning tools. We'll all get through this together. And then when there's a vaccination and when everyone will be safe and not die, then the kids can go back to school. Then we can resume all these great things in your budget, like you know, sports and things that normal families enjoy at school. We love school. We love having that community. Scarborough's the best town. But I really think you should consider that there's a, a pandemic, and South Korea just opened up their schools, and they're a very safe country, and they all got sick, these children, and they closed them back down. So go to the news, keep up with the trends, and realize that if you open your schools, you're setting yourself up for children possibly dying or going to the hospital or being hospitalized. So I think you also should think about adding some more nurses, adding some doctors, adding some medical staff to your school budget, because that's what's gonna happen when these children get sick. And that's my comment. And I'm not sending my children to school, so I'm trying to look at the home-based school, school options through Scarborough School District, since that's where we live, until there's a vaccination or a vaccine. Thank and I you. think you should really understand that I'm not the only person. Okay, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm trying to go in between screens. Can you hear me now? Okay, um, I just, I, I came into the meeting a little bit late, so I apologize if this has already been covered, but um, I did have two questions about the form or the information that you posted that I'm hoping someone can answer for me. So my first question is on page nine of the document. Um, it says, in the category that says potential actions to consider, um, there are four or three boxes at the end of that, um, reducing funding for curriculum investments, reduce funding for administrative positions, and reduce funding for instructional coach positions. And I noticed they were blank. Um, I just was curious as to, are, are those things that we're not looking at any more reductions from or um, just wondering why those were 
blank for potential more actions to consider. And then my other question before that one, before I forget is on the next page, you talk about capital or the capital improvements budget is presented. Um, and I was just looking at the priorities column. Um, there's a lot of stuff here and they all have high priority. Um, are these things, because they are high priority, either put in for whoever put them in as high priority, does that mean um, if you are, quote unquote, allowed to look at these CIP things, we're not going to look at anything labeled as high or medium high priority? Because I, I know that at the last um, school board meeting, one of the things that was discussed was looking at the CIP stuff. and. Some of these things were mentioned at both town council level and school board level, um, but I'm just seeing high priority across the board. Does, does that mean someone has determined that if the CIP can be accessed and, I guess, manipulated, for lack of a better term, that because of these, these have been labeled high priority, um, we're not, we're not going to consider them at all. So those are just two kind of questions or wonders that I had when I was looking at this document. So thank you. Yeah, that was what I was trying to go back and forth with, Sarah, when, when I when you guys called on me. It was to see are some of these items bonded versus um, appropriated already. So you can, you can find it in that second CIP document. You have to cross reference them. The problem is that they sometimes they're not named the same thing, so yeah. it's hard, hard to tell which one's which. Yeah. But that's that's what I've been doing. Okay, thank you. So just so you know, I mean, all of this is an opportunity to take a second swipe look at anything that is in the budget. So even though we may call things high priority or priority or low priority, um, it's always good to go back and review. And there can be things that could be added or taken out. So it's a starting point. It helps us get organized, but it's not blocked. I appreciate that. I just, I think that I personally just need to hear that over and over and over again because I, I will get back on my soapbox. I need people and not things um, right now. So the more I hear that, um, the the better I feel about this whole process. So, so thank you for um, going through that again. Thanks. for giving us this additional iteration of the budget. I know that it's time consuming. I know it's frustrating because it, it's all stuff you feel passionately about. Um, and so it's difficult and that we may not be on the same page. So, um, 
and I think it's important that we all remember that we're all trying to do the best that we can through this process.